almost invariably they try and get away. So Nick's experience is a typical experience of coming across a leopard at short distance. All you see is a blur of spots and colour. Gone. I think they're firmly established in the food chain. They're obviously breeding. I was 12 when I first saw uh, the Black Panther, and those cats are still reported in the same area now. They're here to stay. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. And welcome to episode 109 of Big Cat Conversations. If you're listening on schedule, we're coming to you in April 2024 with this one. I'm pleased to say that we're speaking in depth with a farmer for this edition because we're in conversation with Nick, who's based in the English Midlands and he's in the northern half of the Midlands, north of Birmingham. Nick runs a mixed farm which includes much grassland and established woodland and he's got new emerging woodland from recent tree planting. And to complete the picture, he puts much effort into wildlife management and caring for nature across his land. And part of that wildlife on his land includes big cats sometimes. Nick himself has had a big cat sighting. He's heard of others on the farm and nearby locally. So Nick, thanks for joining us. How are you? Hello, Rick. Very well, thanks. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Hopefully we can give you a little bit of information of what goes on just around where we live. It sounds very interesting, Farm. Can you tell us what different enterprises you've got and what different habitats and landscape types you've got on the farm? Well, we were a dairy farm up until 2007, and uh, we pulled the plug on the dairy yard, running costs, basically. We moved over from being an intensive dairy farm to uh, mid-tier levels, that's hay meadows, and also we put about 60,000 trees in with the woodlands also that we'd already got about 30 acres of woodland. There's adjoining woodlands. There's quite an area that we join into, goes into a a local valley. Since we started the main planting, which was 2011, we're just waiting for another 5,000 trees to go in. Just waiting for the uh, Natural England to tick the boxes to give us a go red. We hope it's going to be sooner than later because spring's coming. Trees need to be got in now. It's a very different type of farm to what we were up until 2007. We get different wildlife. We've got Muntiat deer. We've got roe that have moved in, never seen before, until the last sort of five years. We get uh, occasional reds visiting, which come up from the neighbouring woodlands. Quite an array of bird life, barn owls, buzzards. We get the red kites. Rabbit populations of always been pretty low and when anything did appear it didn't last long and that wasn't through myxomatosis the rabbits have always been quite healthy and it's probably more rabbits this year than I've seen for a long time but when there's someone locally about a sighting of a black cat you can guarantee what few rabbits used to be on would disappear within six weeks and that's normally corresponded with the sighting of a cat Probably I've got probably 14 sightings that I could say. I know the people who are genuine people who've seen them uh, since 1990, have seen a cat, including myself. The changes on the farm, that's very dramatic. So you basically move from intensive dairy to harnessing the more wildlife-based grants from DEFRA and Natural England and moving into the more woodland and hay meadows. Forestry grants, yes. The European Union grant was the first one that we took on. And then from there, we've done a grant for seven trends on uh, basically a ripped up um, drains that we put in back in the early 70s. I actually knew where they were because I was a lad then taking the stone across to, you know, put in them. And uh, we've done an orchid seed mix on that 10 acre field with a wetland area which supplies a pond. We've got a few ponds on the farm which. Um, has all been done since the late 80s right up until today sort of thing. Even when we were dairy farming, we were doing stuff like this, but not on the scale that we've done it. You can appreciate firsthand the change in the wildlife value of the farm, but also 
the way that visiting people appreciate actually getting close to nature yes. and having those experiences like a barn owl. It must be very heartening and rewarding, hopefully. Yes, it's, um, I mean, one of the conditions with the forestry grants was there was public access and the actual public footpath runs through the edge of one of the big plantations. And from that, with maintenance tracks, which we kept narrow, we've got two campsites here. So those people use them trails. The mowed weekly has all the campsites, and we've probably got two and a half miles of them if you have them all together. And people can get out and enjoy themselves, and the seen trees that were put in in 2011, some of the regular people who come, that was basically no more than the same height as a cane and now are 15, 20 feet high. So it's a process of seeing how things happen over a short period of time, which is a short period of time as far as a tree goes. So, yeah, we've dramatically altered things here. Part of the grant I was on was for the um, establishment of woodlands close to the area that the grants were put out on and was for Red Start also distribution. and. Last year, I put new edge rows in. It was the first time I've seen a cock red start. And the small thorn in the mix with all the trees that have gone. And that is the main source for the red start to come back and start breeding and living here again, I suppose. And it's the first one I've ever seen. Very good. The reason I see such as that is because we have deer that come into the plantations. So two, three, four mornings a week. Early morning, before I clean the balls out, I'll uh, go and do them walks to keep the deer moving so you don't get that damage. And it works. Well, we'll come on to that in relation to Big Cat's influence on deer behaviour and deer browsing a bit later on, because I know you've got views on that. It'll be very interesting to hear your comments on that. Let's go through the Big Cat activities that you've heard about through the family and through contacts and yourself. It's your mother's sighting of a tan-coloured one that we start with, but say before then, had you ever heard of big cat sightings before one cropped up in the family? Yes, the one that my mother saw was probably 25 years ago now. The first incident we had here of a big cat was 1990, 1991. And it was uh, my lad, he was 10 at the time, and we got a pond down the fields, he was off down there, um, a, a local chap who stopped it with trout and he said if you want to go have a fish you can as long as you put some back in which he did and as he was going down toward that pond and down the valley on the opposite side of the valley he saw what looked like a big black cat walking up beside the edge of it, about 10 feet out from the edge that afternoon following the brute course probably a mile mile and a half downstream another sighting was made by another farmer's son and that afternoon at three o'clock, he'd done a loop. Uh, a mate of mine who was ploughing a, a field about a mile from here on the neighbouring field to where he was ploughing, he saw this large black cat. He said it was a bit bigger than a Labrador uh, with a very long tail, walk across the field. Uh, and that was the first time that I'd ever heard of anybody seeing one round here. Those seem to be joining the dots. That was all the same one. Yes, same one, yes. That was quite a bombshell, was it, at the time? It was interesting. Of course, at that time, you were hearing Exmoor, Dartmoor, somewhere where the big cat was on there. People thought it was all a myth. It doesn't take a lot of working out, folks who have them for pets. That's where, where they've ended up, and that's how they've got it. You'd heard about them in the southwest, but not in your region? The only other place I'd heard the uh, western edge of the National Forest. Quite often, I've got, well, it's my work when he was friends with a chap who lived in part of the Needle Forest. It's not a big forest as you might think it is. It's individual woodlands scattered, you know. And uh, he'd actually seen one go across his garden twice. And I know another farmer who uh, now has moved down south. His wife said, well, she said to me, because I just mentioned it to her at that time, they lived on the edge of about 3,000 acres plantation there. On hot summer nights, when they got the bedroom windows open, he says you could hear the cats shouting at mating time. 
And I know my work, workman replied one morning when he was coming because we used to start just half five in the morning with the milking. We got a bungalow on the drive where they live, still do live. And as he walked up one morning, he said to me, he says, oh, he says, I've just heard a noise down a field called the Sweet Hills. He says, it just sounds like something here on David Attenborough's program, like one of them cats. Yeah. Things from there progressed. I became interested. And I think, I'm, I mean, all the times I walk around these woods, it's so annoying. I've never seen one here, but six miles away. I was coming about quarter to ten at night. It was dark, and I just caught one at the end of my headlights. And there was a, basically a stone wall that had fallen over. It was side of the road with a sheep netted fence that had gone flat. Basically, uh, I saw the iron cord with the long tail. It didn't run. It just stepped over the, over the wall. That was on a Friday night, and I know on the following Wednesday night, this is what makes this one so interesting, he did for me at the time. On the following Wednesday night, I went over six miles east at that point to pick up my chainsaws. I've got a friend who serves my chainsaws. As I got there at his house, uh, he was in his garage. I mentioned to him, you never guess what I saw the other night, because he's, he was interested in wildlife. And he says, come here, come here. I says, sorry. He says, come on the lawn. Come around the back of the house with me. So I thought, well, what's he on about? So anyway, I went round to the back of the house, and his daughter was there, the two grandchildren. He said to his daughter, he says, uh, tell Nick what you saw on Monday night. She looked at me as if, say, do I have to, you know? And I said, go on, tell him. So he says, yeah. He says, well, I was going to pick these up. They were babysitting for us. And as I come around the corner, about a mile up the road, I know where exactly where it was, a sharp end, and there's a very tall edge, probably about 10 foot tall. She says there's a black panther in the middle of the road. She says it's spun around on its haunches, because it's only a country lane. She says it went straight up over the edge like it was on a spring. Now, when you stood in in the garden, you looped northeast in a straight line. It was about six miles to the point where I'd seen it on the Friday night. So she'd seen it on the Monday, and it was the Wednesday when I went to pick my chainsaws up, and they told me, so you could say over that period, it took it about two, two and a half days to move that far. And I heard again, and I can't remember this one, but it was about the same time, about six weeks later, it had been seen on a lane which is called Long Lane. It's an old Roman route, the old route to Derby, and it had been seen there. And that was the only time that I've actually seen half a one. I would have loved to have seen it all, but, you know, it was just the tail and the iron quarters. It would be about knee height. I think people sometimes think, they say big cats. They're not that big. About knee height. The other two I've mentioned to you earlier that uh, saw them up here said about the same, about knee height. Still big enough to take a deer down? Oh, yes. I've not seen any evidence... What I've found is, I think I sent a picture, the picture of those prints, all the deer prints off the trails disappeared for about 10 days. Then they gradually come back again, so something had moved them. The only time, as I can say, that um, we have the photo I sent you on the sheep that had, had its head bitten, and two years ago, my next-door neighbor, the lady there, said she got a sheep that was quite ill. She didn't expect it to live through the night. It was just back of the farm in a little field. And then the next day, she was expecting it to be dead, and it was. And that had got the same sort of top of the head bite mark into it. But the interesting thing was with both of them, the one that happened up here this winter, both sheep were on their own and weren't well. You know, they were going down. But the crows nor the magpies had pecked their eyes out. Now, when a sheep goes down, Crows and magpies will peck their eyes out when they're still alive. But these were being dead. Now, the one that happened here, January time, something like that, January Feb, I was cleaning the bulls out, and it was about half oh, past seven in the morning. Some of the sheep had been out, because we were on the wintering scheme, and I rung the chap who owns the flock to just let him know. And uh, he was en route to get them out. Like It was about five hours later he turned up. And then he brought this dead one across. But when I was cleaning the bulls out and uh, it was forking a barrow, I have never, ever seen so many crows 
kick off in all my life on some plough ground that neighbours were that was just beyond where the sheep had been brought down. And you think fox, cat, domestic cat, or something like that. You see that all the time. But I've never seen anything quite like that. And then four hours later, the chap who has the sheep on here went across on his quad bike and says, look at this. I think Richard sent you a photograph of how it had been taken on top of the head. And that would be typical. A sheep that's not well, or even protecting lambs, would bend its head if it was facing something. And I think it's gone for the top of the head. But on both carcasses, nothing else was taken. But the interesting thing was the eyes hadn't been pecked out and it'd probably been dead four hours. The only time I can say I've seen a carcass taken, I used to farm wild boar in the woods. We packed that up in 2012. And one of the pens I left in place for a lady who, um, she'd lost uh, a son to cancer and she was doing this fundraising, the cancer trust type thing, you know, to raise money. And she wanted to invest and some baggage goats that she wanted to utilize the pen. What can I put in there? So I said, what do you know anything that you want a rare breed? So she went for the baggage goats, and we managed to find five. But after a couple of years, we got two pens left, and one was in a bog area, which had got one little rhododendron bush, and these goats at the rhododendron, and we nailed them. So I got five dead goats. So I always remember it was a weekend Sunday when I went to Lucum, and they were all there dead so oh my gosh you know and you could see straight away what had happened so i pulled them out and put them on this fire home in a pile ready for taking it across on the monday morning for the knackerman to pick up he said i'll be there in the afternoon believe you me the live goat smells and their mind are dead they did just whiff i went across to fetch these five goats on the loader bucket for the knackerman there was only four and i thought where the hell's that gone you know the fox had started to eat one, it would eat it there and then not take it off. And we looked everywhere and we couldn't find it. Of course, it's summer and everywhere's green, you know, the bracken's up and everything. It wasn't until the autumn that we found its skeleton and it was about 50 yards away. And that cat had been seen at that time, at that week, actually. So I would imagine that's what had dragged it. Well, it'd be interesting also, if you do find a deer carcass, an an eviscerated deer carcass on your land one day, that will up the interest. Yes. The only other weird thing that I came across, this is going back, oh gosh, six years ago, a badger carcass. And this badger, the skin, the back end of the badger, had been rolled, just like you think, you know, you roll the blanket up, it had been rolled right back up to its head. And the carcass was totally lit clean. At that time, I think it went, well, just down the road, another two miles down the road, a lady had seen a panther go across a garden. So you put two and two together again and make four. And then two years on from that, they saw the same thing again about 250 yards from that spot from the previous previous occasion. Same thing, the skin was rolled totally back on it. Nothing eats a badger. You know, you'll see a dead badger on the road. Unless they collect them up, that's where they stay. If they're dead close enough to the set, they get dragged back by individuals and entombed in the set, or they get bloated and just nothing. Yes. I've seen a couple, because they've been pointed out to me by people, of filleted out badger carcasses, and I've seen about four photos, and I use some of them in my talks, and all of those informants concluded. This has to be a big carnivore like a cat. There's nothing else in Britain that normally would devour a badger. No, and it was uh, unusual. I don't know a lot about this side of things, but do cats eat bones or do they just lick them clean? These were lick clean. They weren't, you know, the bones haven't been crunched. I think there are two reasons they will consume bones, partly because they're part of the processing of the carcass. It's They indirectly crunch some and shear some and they go in with the consumption. But I think sometimes their body just knows they need a bit of calcium. But largely they'll work around bones and, as you say, rasp them clean if they've got time. Sometimes they can get disturbed on a carcass. People say how feisty badgers are. Yeah, I know we had a badger game back in 1970 with a really ton of, on a cat that had kittens, so we got the ton of video and everything. We had her for about two years. She'd um, come in the house at night 
she'd have a bowl of bread and milk and beach and we to mix and then she'd go off in the woods in the day and she was blind when we had her. She was only about the size of a large mouse. You know, it was blind. Some chaps, had, um, which I don't agree with, but they'd been foxing with terriers. They dug this hole out and uh, there was this little baby badger down in there. So they brought it back to us and, uh, as I say, we'd have this black bobtail cat. We'd had kittens. And so we threw it in with the uh, kittens and uh, two years down the line, we'd have a badger come in the house, sitting on the arse, rolling the cat over with its nose and trying to suck off it and uh, sitting with the Jack Russells as well. You know, it's a bit unique, really. Got some family video of it on, you know. So have to take it off, put it on a stick. You'd be able to see that. Yeah, and they all got on and they, because they'd all just grown up together. Oh, yes. What it used to do, um, as it got older, we them days we grew 60 acres of corn as well, and before we had the corn bin, so all the corn was bagged up the loft, and there's 90 ton went up there, the this, this sacks were stacked three high. And at the end of the loft, there's a little window, which looked out onto the uh, little ports that we have, the tiled roof, and then we've got a landing window above the tiled roof. And if it spotted you, there's a water tank up in that loft, with straw around it, because it could keep the frost off. So it'd climb up on the barriers, get behind the water tank, that was its nest. But then when it come out, it's usually about six o'clock at night, if it spotted you through the window and you were in the landing wind, it tapped two or three times and just burst through the glass of the window off the loft, jump on the roof, and then you have to haul it in through the landing wind to get it down and downstairs again. Uh. A bit of a character she was. But even when you were playing with her, you know, uh, she'd have a play bite, but you would not want her to bite your nastily to take your hand off, you know. So she never became social in, within a set? We don't know. At that period in time, 1970, 71, you would find, before the shotgun licence and really clamped down, you get poaching going on around the fields. And just a couple of occasions, she came back, oh, peppered her back end, because if she saw you on the, the woods or in the fields at night, you know, in the evening, not at night, but in the evening walking around, she come running up to you and follow you around, just like dogs do. And some poacher sees that, they think she's going to attack them, and so they let cut it. And we think at the end of the day, she just disappeared off the face of the earth. Whether she did mate up, I doubt it. I think more than likely she was shot. Because with having our scent, you know, our scent was picking up, throwing her over your shoulder, you wild badgers probably wouldn't take to her, you know, with the smell. You gave her a bit of a life anyway. Oh, yes, yeah. On the cats, and all the ones you've heard about, bar your mum's sightings, have been black, haven't they? Could we go to your mum's sighting? Because that one is interesting, because that was a tan-coloured one. So if you tell us about that. It's one of the early ones. Uh, it's probably about probably 22, three years ago now. And I've uh, got a little brute course in the village, and where she lived down the bottom end of the ground of the farm was on the roadside, we were way up on the top of the sticks. She was just going down through the village, and she saw this... Um, Big, like I said, she was a big cat walking up the brute course that was brown. And at that time, a lynx had been shot over at Sudbury and a chap who came metal detecting here, his brother worked at the local quarry, which is about three miles away. He was going into work one morning, there was a dead rabbit middle of the road and he said a lynx shot out the edge, picked the rabbit up, shot back in the edge. Now, if you go 40 miles from here, there was a private zoo. I say private zoo, go public, go because my two my kids. And the rumour that went round at that time, the links that were in that collection were let go. And I remember they had nine, I think there was two Siberians, two Europeans, a Spanish, and a bobcat. I can't remember what else, but it was quite a big collection. Is this the Ryber Castle one? That's the one, yes. Oh, they definitely got out. They absolutely definitely got out, and uh, most of them didn't return. Right, yeah, so that, that's Ryber Zoo, yeah, yeah, and it closed. I did talk to an old mate, he's dead now, a mate of mine. My cousin's a small old in, about three miles from here. Ken had had a um, back end of a Black Panther on his security camera. It wasn't video, and he just his dog was being mad one night, and he just looked on his camera, and he could see the back end and tail of this cat just looking into one of his buildings. And... Another a mate of mine and his, as I went over there, this particular, he was telling me about what's happened that day. And uh, his mate called me, you know, what Adrian did. And I says, oh, Have you seen this Black Panther aid? And he says, uh, No, I says, No, I haven't seen that. He says, What I saw, off the arms of the links. So you've got two stories there, two different cats. 
And it was about that time, you know, it will be about that time. No sighting of links since then. I've not heard anything anyway, but it's just the black ones. Your mother's one. Did she liken it to a mountain lion, or do you think the description adds up to a potential mountain lion? What do you remember about what she said? The description she gave, to me, didn't sound like a lynx. It seemed too long, how she said it. It had a full tail, did it, do you think? Yes, I think she said yes. She wouldn't know a mountain lion from a black panther. She just said it was a large brown cat walking up the roof course. And she rung the next door neighbour's farm, so we've only sheep in the field because we've just seen a great big cat walking up the roof course. And that's as far as it went, really. And I said to her, what colour was it? She said brown. I said, was it short and stuffy? She said, oh, no, 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 it's got a long tail. And so that's no lynx. Interesting that they haven't continued. It is predominantly black ones you're all seeing now. Yes, yeah, the ones that I get fed back on. For me, I know saw all that back end of that one that time. The most interesting one occurred. It was the second lockdown, the day of the lockdown. We don't get much holiday. Myself and the wife and kids were just going over to um, North Wales for a couple of days to land Dudno. But then it didn't happen because lockdown had just come with the COVID. And so we just had a ride down to Lord Lowe and went by call the next day. But anyway, a mate of mine, Andy, he comes and just stays the weekend and looks after the place while we're gone, feeds the bulls and cleans them out. And uh, Kerry's mate comes as well. They both got caravans here. And this particular day, we'd gone out and they'd had a walk around the woods in the afternoon. We got back, well, we were back for four o'clock still daylight and uh, they just remarked to him, we found this great big grass nest down the bottom wood. He says, oh, well, you can have a look at it. We just, you know, never seen nothing like it. I went down and, yeah, there's this big nest made of grass, perfect. No smell there. I got down on my hands and knees and had a whiff because going back to 1990, we'd felled some larch. I'd replanted it using the two meter side deer guards and it was sort of July time, the bracket had got quite high and I was bringing it over just to give him some light and I heard something go crashing out of the wood and I thought it was a fox or a badger. But when I got to the point where I'd heard the noise, there was this real smell that was totally different. I thought, what's that? And then also I dropped on this grass nest, which the smell was coming from. I thought, I've smelt this smell somewhere before. I thought, I don't know I smelt that. Chester Zoo. We took the kids like 18 months earlier. So next day, it was a day off. So myself, wife, my brother and his wife and family, we all went to Chester Zoo. I wanted to go to the cat house where we'd been the previous two years. They got two black panthers there and they were behind, behind glass. It looked like they got cage madness. They were just pounding up and down. Anyway, I got there. They were, I didn't, couldn't see them. They weren't there. But we went to the cheetah, the lion cage. The smell was just the same. So all cats smell the same. So I assume then that's what, in 1990, what that was. And this nest was the same, except it had just been made. Now, that night, it was raining heavy then from 6 o'clock till probably about 11. And Andy and his wife got out to Kevin and his wife's caravan, which is only 20 yards apart. But they back where their two caravans are, they back into a... Uh, the edge of the woodland is where there's young Norway spruce about 20 foot high. This packs onto the buildings, the former cubicle shed, which we use for storage now. So Andy came out down the side of the caravan, looked to the right, and in the storage area where we have some more caravans stored, he saw what he thought was a dog coming up the concrete towards the first caravan that was on the edge of the storage area. Then it disappeared behind the caravan. Thought nothing of it. He's waiting for Karen to come out. And um, this, what he thought was a dog, appeared straight in front of him on the, on the last caravan. And there's a doorway that goes into the former cubicle shed, which we had there as it was. Doors open. And he put his flashlight on. It was only about 12 feet away from him, 15 feet. And it was a black panther. He said it looked at him, just totally ignored him, walked into the shed, he thought, I'm seeing things here. So he went to the edge of the shed, put his flashlight onto the floor of the shed. That was dry concrete in there where it was wet concrete outside. 
and uh, got the poor prints going into the shed and into the uh, packing yard area where the milking pole used to be. You didn't go any further than that. It's just blue this, you know. But uh, it says it wasn't phased by him at all. Didn't run off. Just walked, carried on walking. And the explanation to that is perhaps the flashlight dazzled it so he couldn't actually see Andy. Perhaps the wind was in the direction where he couldn't smell it. You never know. Or he just wasn't phased. What did he think it was actually doing? Ratting or something, do you think? No, he thinks with it being rain, you know, he was looking for somewhere to get out the rain. Oh, fair enough, yeah. Sheds are quiet, and um, that was on a Saturday night. Then on the Tuesday night, going six miles away again, another farmer who my son knows so well, I knew the lad's dad, but he since died, he um, saw a black panther come out of a reed bed that's round a pond. He saw him come out two mornings on the top. It would have been the same cat. But I know my mate, when he went, he goes to the air rifle club. And he didn't want to tell anybody because nobody really believes, you know, you know what I mean? He, he just wanted to be put on the spot, you know. And uh, anyway, he was telling his mate what he'd seen on Saturday night. He says, I can't believe this. He says, you know, he says, I was out with a friend who was calling badgers for DEFRA. And uh, he got night vision sights on. And his mate said, just have a look through these sights here and look at that. It was a Valentine Acre field and there was a black panther walking across the field. Now that area is part of the Needwood Forest area. So that makes that a separate sighting to what he'd seen. Just couldn't do them 20 miles and be six miles away at the same time. That would be... Two years ago, three years ago, on the lockdown, when lockdown occurred again, the very same day. And then two years ago, a lady who camps with us, she was camping on campsite one, and we have a portal which is situated back into the Christmas tree. And she walked off out of the uh, camping field to the portal. It was half past seven in the morning. And she said there was a black panther sitting on the middle of the track about 20, 30 feet from us. She says it just got up. He turned sideways onto her, says it's about the size of a Labrador, very long tail, and uh, just walked into the Christmas trees. He didn't know him, she said, he just walked into the trees and just disappeared. So them things I find very interesting, you know. If you relate back to the sightings that you've heard where people have been close enough like Andy and hers and some of your other farmer contacts, you're getting the sense that they're healthy, fit, confident, wild creatures that are you know, earning their living fine in our countryside, do you? Yeah. And get, going back to the one where the badger skin was rolled back, we had hardly any rabbits at that time. So perhaps that was a hungry cat, you know? Yeah, switching to badgers because lack of rabbits, yeah. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Are people describing them as jet black or do people ever see any kind of texture or markings on them at all? When I've um, had the reports come back, there's one chap, and the lad knew again three miles away, a bit more, four miles away, saw one cross the road. He said he'd seen a black panther go across the road, and that's coming out of woodland area. And uh, another chap who stores a van with us, his father in law, used to have a pheasant shoot on here back in the 1990s. And uh, the chap who was in the shoot, he saw a black panther go across the same place as this lorry driver had seen it, but sort of 10 years apart. I think. Myself, over the period of time, they got to be breeding because they'd be dead. Anything seen in 1990 wouldn't be living today. Yeah, so 15 years tops is their life. Yeah. Maybe a bit longer in Britain where it's an easier life. In their native countries, I think 15 years is a good life for them. But people are always describing them as jet black, are they? Does anybody ever see a slight different colour tone? No. Only that one, that occasion, and the lynx, the lad who told me about the lynx, but no, it's always a black panther. And even this autumn, when we got that last photo, it was a smaller print than the one we got after Andy. The original print I sent to you, you got a dog print on one side and the print with no claws on the other side. That was bigger than the print we got this autumn. And again, that had got no claw marks on the, you know, where the dog can't retract its claws, where a cat does. How I found that one was, I was just going through one of the woodland walk areas and this hare ran in front of me, ran towards me, stopped dead, it saw me, 
the direction it came from didn't want to go back on it. It was on one of the woodland trails and it was quite wet at the time. I thought I'm going to video this, so I videoed it. And he came right down past me and basically uh, within five foot told me, I've never seen that before. I thought something's frightening this air. So uh, I went and did the circuit around this part of the woodland trail and that's when I picked up on this one print and it didn't come down the trail, it just crossed it straight into the wood. But it was a smaller print than the one from three years ago. Very interesting that the hare decided to get that close to you. Must have been a reason. Yes. Going back to the um, the layup, the nest, the, what I would call a layup spot, perhaps. If you get one of those again, of course, that is a place to put your trail cameras close to. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's very rare for people to find a layup spot, and it sounds, from what you've said, it sounds like your conclusion is a very reasonable one that it would have been cat related. Yes. I've noticed that my little domestic cat little nests in in the local field edges where there's long grass, the grass is a complete rotation as they lay down and curl up. And deer don't do this. When deer nests are, I've noticed when deer lay up and create a nest, they don't curl it round, whereas the cats do. I know that from, you know, Zaki, my little cat. If you get another one, you can check for hairs. The air off the cat. And maybe sort of lick your hands and press your hands into the grass and see if any hairs stick onto your hands and then you've got them. Yeah, yeah. But the other interesting thing with this one was, because it, it had just been made, there's no smell to it. I don't think it, 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 it had made it, it perfect. I've never seen nothing like it. Other than that other one, which was had been used, was a lady who um, was here camping. She showed me a picture. She says, look at this, Nick. I said, oh, yes, yeah. that's that nest down in the wood we found yesterday. She said, I don't know, she's my daughter's up on holiday up in Northumberland. And she's just seen this. She sent me this picture. What is it? I said, it's the same as what we've got down the wood. So it was ironic. The same day as the lads found that, this lady's daughter on holiday in Northumberland had seen exactly the same type of nest. OK. You don't think it was a deer, a deer one, a deer bed? I thought she would photograph the one we got, but no, it wasn't. She said, no, no, she says, that's my daughter said that. She's on holiday up there. It was perfectly round. Yeah, and you were telling me before we started recording that you got trail cameras because you obviously had them for wildlife. Yes. Because that's part of the business of the farm. But, of course, there's always the bonus that they might catch a cat. Now, you were saying the one time you strung some bait up. Can you tell us about that? Why did you put the bait out and what happened? There'd been a sighting of uh, the black cat. I think that could have been three miles away. A lady seen it go across the lawn, and then somebody saw it up on about probably a mile and a half, and they would seen it on one of the roads go over a wall. So that inspired us. Uh, me, me old friend Clive, I say he died four years ago now, but inspired us to um, have a go. We put the camera on a tree. We hung this um, leg of lamb up on the Scotch pine branch, and uh, hoping to get it, but the infrared had failed on that. But then we, we did it again after Andy had seen that one three years ago. We did it with a pig's head, half a pig's head. Again, we did it with sizel. We didn't, didn't do it with plastic string. We did it with the old-fashioned bale sizel. And that had been fetched off, but that was not taken. It was still on the floor. And there was a black hair stuck, because it was a bit sticky, the head was. It was a black hair stuck to the side of the pig's cheek. Now, there's one or two things. So we bagged this air up. I bagged it up. Wherever I put it, I don't know. I saved it. But there could have been even a badger air. It could have been easily, you know, because they are quite bristly as well. The cat's hairs are often very soft, in fact. Yeah, this was quite bristly, this was. But the, the interesting one from six, seven years ago with Clive, I saved the sizal because it was so interesting how it had been shredded. With weight, something had literally swung on it. It hadn't just broke it, you know, they shredded it. And uh, it ended up catch, keep getting wrapped up in paperwork and all kinds of drawers. So I thought, well, there's no use keeping this, nobody's interested in it. So we just got through. I wish I'd saved it now. You'd have DNA on it, probably, you know. One of the reasons we have the camera set now for six years is to get the cat. As I say, when we see a print, and it's only them 
couple that I've seen. And then there was another one on the track in the wood where the back foot had gone onto the front foot. Yes, direct register. Yes, yeah. What what we'd had some rain and it's and it's a track that goes through the wood and now and then these little shower puddles. You get this little layer of mud only about a quarter inch thick, washed down with it. These heavy rains we've had. Again, it hadn't gone along the track. It had crossed it, so it come out the brambles and gone across the track. And the back foot had gone onto the front foot. I had not seen that before. There are no claw marks either. Occasionally you can get dogs that direct register like that, but yeah, it is a trait of the cats because of their stealthy walking, certainly. Yeah. You were saying also that you've had one, you think, growl at you when you're out with the dogs. Oh, gosh. Yes. This was two weeks after Andy had that sighted, and it had been sighted again six miles away, coming out that pond. And what it was, I was just in the woodland walk to keep the deer on the move, and I got my two dogs with me, uh, which have passed away since. My little Jack was Dix and uh, uh, Brown and White Collie Pop. Yes, I was uh, walking one of the trails which goes through part of the ancient woodland. Cuckoo was shouting. I was just walking along, Bracken's eye, and all of a sudden we had this great big deep throaty growl to the right of us, probably, I don't know, no more than 20. 30 feet from us to the right on the slope. I stopped dead. The dogs stopped dead. The dogs looped, looked at each other, looked at me, and I thought, just walk, don't run. Mm. <laughs> but it was like, it was a real, you know, a real deep throaty growl, as if, um, just to say, just a warning growl, or perhaps been startled, you know, but it was definitely, I've never come across that before. Yeah, it did send a bit of a shudder down your spine. It did. It definitely made the dogs quake. Stop dead in the tracks. Literally stop dead. We all did, you know. Normally they'd bark. Well, Dick's would be Jack Russell, but no, they didn't bark. They just looked as if they didn't like what they did, you know. Have you been on the internet and tried to find a similar noise? Yes, straight away when I got back, yes. Did it correlate with a leopard? Yes, it was... It was um, Bang on, yeah. Deer do make a similar noise, but no, the deer one wasn't like, you know, the leopard one. It was more like the leopard one we heard. I guess also the dogs wouldn't react to a deer one, perhaps. No, it's something that you don't expect. <laughs> I don't think for one minute uh, they'd bother coming towards you. They'd just ignore you and just go away, get out your road, you know. Unless they were utterly desperate. They would go for the dogs, I think, if they were really struggling. But uh, they're not struggling. <laughs> no, they're not, no. <laughs> My two brown and white collies were always... Um, they got their own shed and they were loose at night. But that was the only occasion ever that um, that would happen. In terms of the influence of big cats on your life and your farming activities what would you say do you do any tweaks and adjustments and are you a super alert or do you just get on with it and think you know if there's any big cat around at any one time we'll just work around each other if we need to how does it influence your thought process and your actions as a farmer um with the farming just carry on as normally ever really think about it the only time i think about it is when I'm doing the trails to keep the deer on the move, you know, where the trees are quite young. Sometimes, for what it is, you just remember that big growl, you know. <laughs> You're hoping to see one, but all the miles I've done, yeah. <laughs> I mean, your point about this really is that big cats do that. They do keep the deer shifting. You're OK about big cats because of their influence on deer to allow trees to regenerate, basically. Is that the point? Yes, yeah. One of the big plantains, it's all mixed hardwoods. There's a bit of softwood in there as well. Put them in with my own planter behind my tractor. But we had a real bad vole infestation get into it. So then there's a lot of spade replanting. It took us over three years to do that, mate, and uh, through the winters. So we met the targets with the grants, you know. So then it's them younger trees now that were susceptible because the other trees that survived create cover for deer to move in, which they did do. So the reason for walking it is uh, just to give them younger trees a couple of years, chance to get up out of the item being topped. 
you still get a little bit of barking, but we don't get much damage at all. You know, the, you read about deer damage, and probably where deer are thick on the ground, especially fowler. I mean, yes, I bet you get some damage, but beyond the odd, the odd one that we've seen barked, it's a good habitat for wildlife to move around on. But you wouldn't have seen a roe deer here 20 years ago. You would never imagined it. Now we've got them here, there and everywhere. Another time you might get cat activity on, on any farm and any bit of land is in, say, May to July, when the fawns, the kids are from the deer, are just newborn, because the cats obviously you know, target, like they do in any country, any native country, these big cats. Easy pickings. Yeah, they really target them. And, of course, that helps the culling as well, really. That's natural culling. Yeah, you, you probably uh, hit the nail on the head there a bit because, yes, we've got deer, but we never get them thick on the ground. So something could be just... Uh, you never see a deer carcass, but with a young, as I say, a fawn, it'd be gone. There won't be anything left. That's right, yeah. My dog, Duke, sniffed out one in long grass, a newborn roe kid, last summer and i honestly thought it was a rabbit at first it was obviously newborn within a day old and mum had left it as they do for a while and it was so tiny and duke had sniffed it out and left it alone and they are so tiny when they're born but of course they quickly grow up pretty big actually oh yes yeah first month they're absolutely easy bambies for the but of course even an adult red deer can be a target for a big cat they've got the technique and the power Oh, gosh, yes. But I don't think they like putting themselves at risk if they're smaller prey, like the rabbit. I think that's right, but I think they do need bigger prey. If they decide a deer is there for the springing on and taking down, they will do so, but any bigger prey is a slight injury risk. Yes. I mean, mice and uh, rats and voles they'll go for as well. We've had two sightings this year of people seen a big cat and a barn owl or in one case it was barn owl in another case it was a um, short-eared owl quartering the field for voles and a big cat there as well well i assume that the big cat was there munching on the voles as well yeah and i know when uh, it's only now voles which we got into that big plantation about 30 voles running in front of you you know absolutely a plague of them and so the food source is there and our type of country around here, there's no shortage of that rough pasture and uh, that type of countryside, you know. I know when I was mowing the buzzards, part of the control for the field bowl in this, this plantation, we'd been being there about seven days mowing. We put buzzard posts in, just a fencing post, and it was every 50 yards. So the buzzards got something to land on, but when the trees were young, and then they'd take the voles out from there. But I know I was mowing one night, late finishing. It had snowed, put about an inch of snow down in the full moon. I just carried on because I was nearly finished, so I wanted to just carry on getting it finished. And there was buzzards actually hunting at night, and there was a fox about three rows of trees off me. And you see them on the telly, don't you? When you see them in the snow, jump up in the air, then land down face first into the snow I've got a fox doing that and two buzzards you only think owls hunt at night but I do know how buzzards do as well <laughs> no I hadn't heard that how interesting and they do just take them out yeah the buzzards do yeah so you see the cats as a farmer your attitude about these cats is that they are part of the ecosystem well we've lost we lost the wolf back in Scotland in the 1700s, 1500s in this country. So we've realistically got no big predator. And I think this is a predator which it's not going to, well, not round here, very knowledge anyway, attacking flocks of sheep or anything like that. They don't like wool anyway. So I can't see there's a big risk element with them. And like with the sightings we've had here, with the, you know, I think Gail just got up and walked off. That was a lady who was camping on your land. Yeah, she, yeah she uh, stores a caravan with us. And I spoke to her uh, three days ago. And she said, yeah, she'd love to have a word with you on what she saw, yeah. Great, very interesting. So you're not phased by it, and you see it as a positive, if anything? What I do now is a big positive, yes, with the woodland, yes, yes. Because it is keeping stuff on the move that does the damage, and when the government are paying you grant, they won't see that. The results, positive results, and uh, 
if you've got stuff that's sitting there in one place, it'll do you a lot of damage, you know, like a deer. Uh, the stuff's on the move, and that's why I, I do walk it myself as well as, say, three days a week. That's how I drop on prints from time to time, you know. What about other farmers, neighbouring farmers? Or have you got any kind of feedback about how other landowners and farmers feel about the potential of the cats? Yeah, I know um, my agent from the forestry work, his son on the school bus saw what she thought was one um, this autumn, about three miles away, sitting on a plough on plough ground. It was foggy, and you saw it. Yeah, a lot of people don't believe it still, seeing as believing, and I always look at it like that. Do you think though that fellow farmers around you are tolerant or neutral about it? If they're not having sheep taken, they're not bothered. It's about whether they cause impacts, presumably. Yeah, nothing there to anything. They won't even think about it. Yeah. They'll just perhaps say, oh, I heard the other day somebody saw one of them black cats, and that's about it, you know. So they'd have to be bothered. One would have to be misbehaving to bother them. Yes. It's like to get dogs worrying sheep, then there's a big bother. That does happen now and again. No, there's nothing like that. No, you're not hearing of anybody in, in the region or in, in the neighbourhood that is suffering impacts from them, which is good news, of course. Not at all. No. Say there was a a proposal to eradicate them. Access was requested to your land to set traps up or set hides up to dispatch one. Would you play dumb and say, well, sorry, you can't come on my land because we haven't got them all? Would you deny access? I just, well, I deny access would say there's not a problem, if anything. The times that it has been on here, it'll be uh, actually doing me a favour, catching a rabbit and chasing deer about. Let's say moving deer about on scent, which I've witnessed that with, with, the, with the prints we got. The deer prints disappeared for a good 10 days on the trails, perhaps up to a month at some times. I can't see any reason. I mean, it's not a native to this country where the wolf was, but if you introduced a wolf around here, then you'd have help. You know, the sheep would be having the right old uh, grueling. <laughs> I can't see there's a problem. I think in this country you find little red riding will do a lot of damage. Anything with teeth, everybody gets hyped like, up about. The lynx, as I see it, is just a predator that will prey on road here and rabbit. Again, you see a deer is much easier to take down. I know it's fast, but it hasn't got the weight of a sheep, which would cause more damage to whoever's trying to catch it, you know, than what a deer would probably. I'm on about a roe deer or, you know, a monkey. Red deer, obviously, uh, bigger. But no, I can't see a problem. And if there's a problem with somebody who's having, I think I did hear somebody up in Scotland had had um, sheep taken out a few years ago, but uh, not round here. And if there's a problem, then that problem has to be resolved, obviously, because it's financial. But as far as I'm concerned, this is one one thing about here, it's doing a good job, keeping things moving. If one misbehaved like you knew it took your dog, would that change your attitude or you saw one eyeing up your dog? Would you think, well, you know, we've got to be super careful and maybe try and trap it or something? Can you envisage a, a situation where you might change your mind? I honestly couldn't uh, see that situation. I couldn't. I know in uh, Africa, I've got a friend um, who lived in South Africa, and he said he's just to lock the dogs up at night because the leopards would come into the gardens, kill them. Small dogs especially, as well known. Yes, that does happen, absolutely. Yeah, And people have to put metal spike collars on the dogs as well, don't they? Yes, yeah. But here, I think there's plenty of food for it. I don't think that would ever happen. I don't. Even when we, we was across the woods on that trail and we three dogs stopped, I think even if it was hungry and it saw me standing there and big dog and a little dog, it's got to take three things on. And I don't think it would happen. You know, it's probably got more brains to let's wait for the next rabbit to come. We've had several dog walkers had several dog walkers say that they've had a confrontation and the cat just withdrew. And I think it's because it's a messy scenario for the cat. Yeah, exactly. They'll suss it out. They'll suss the situation. I want to win this, not lose it. Because if I lose it, that's it. I'm done for. 
He's got to catch his next rabbit. Needs to keep fit, you know. It's great that you're also on the case, you know, wanting to get footage on the trail cameras, looking for carcasses. And I know that a couple of my contacts who've got thermal cameras are going to pay a visit and um, stay and do some thermal camera work, which would be terrific. What I will do when they do come as well, I'll take them to the surrounding area, because there's a vast area of woodland where they can look at, which is all connected. Excellent, yeah. They've got vantage point. That's it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the thing is, as well, if I get a sighting and somebody says, Oh, somebody's seen a black cat the other day, I shall give you a ring and say, Is one been seen? But the chances are now it's six miles in either direction. It's like that. You know, it's one of them. Yeah, they're very difficult to catch up with, I think, in terms of getting evidence yeah. and getting your cameras or whatever. But I mean, the other thing that you describing how you've got this network of woodlands and pathways and, and meadows now. It sounds like you've got a connectivity issue with surrounding farms and surrounding landscape, which is good for wildlife generally, of course, and yes. I think good for the cats as well. As well. They've got these corridors of woodland. That's right. Yes, and edge rows. Yeah. Look forward to paying a visit and seeing it. And We've said that we'll try and do a talk with your ecological advisors and farmer friends and we'll have a good sort of evening talking it through. That'd be nice. Yes, I'll have a word, see if we can get um, a meeting up here. One of my sheds is converted over uh, where we run karaoke on Saturday nights for the campus. So we've got the tables and chairs in there. We've got a screen and projector. That'd be good, that would. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I remember we did a, a talk evening with farmers at the Royal Agricultural University about five years ago, myself and Andrew Hemmings, who leads the Big Cat Research work there and uh, one of the farmers turned up early and he and he nudged me and said when my neighbor comes ask him to show you what's on his mobile phone camera i could see who his neighbor was because he sat next to him and they had a chat and this guy was just leaving at the end and i thought that must be the guy that i've got to you know ask to see what's on his phone yeah. <laughs> so, so i said excuse me uh, do you have any footage on your phone and he really wasn't very keen to show me but he had the best trail camera footage nighttime footage of a mountain lion that i've ever seen yeah. you could see he was pretty reluctant to show it yes you know i've been tipped off to ask him and andrew hemmings host at the royal Agriculture culture university could see across the room that i was being shown what he wanted to see as well and this guy marched off and andrew <laughs> andrew raced down the corridor <laughs> to see it as well and he came back absolutely gobsmacked couldn't believe how good but there you go, there was a farmer who'd had one on his land, a mountain lion on his land in Gloucestershire, caught on the trail camera, shows his mates, but is not keen to show other people. But that's how it goes. Yeah, I understand it. It is frustrating, but I do understand. And Yeah. It's about trust, isn't it? It is. Well, it is, yes, yeah. Andy Martin, mate, he was very deep to tell anybody. I sort of tried build his conference by telling a few people while he's standing next to me, you know. And there's another another interesting one was um, he's retired now, but he's got a couple of about three miles away, got a little nursery, and the chap who ran it, he's fetched his leaf mould and peat and whatever you from a, it's a forestry centre down in Mid Wales, and he said he got travelled down to a fair what a forestry ground down there, and one day he was going to fetch his truck and a black panther run across in front of him down there. He told them what he'd seen down at the forest department and then they contacted him again. I think he was on uh, the local radio station giving a little talk on what he'd seen. It just shows you they are widespread, you know. Absolutely, and a lot of people don't want to talk about it. Just putting your head on the line and getting poked at. <laughs> well, I know the listeners will be, the listeners of this podcast, especially you being a farmer and having, you know, all those practical experience on the land and, and with your wildlife and Listeners will appreciate that you came on and you know put your head on the block, as it were. Put me head on the block, yeah. <laughs> Anything else finally you'd like to say you don't think we've covered? Any final reflections and points? I think we've covered most things. The only other thing, obviously, you can't see it here, but the local paper, I saved it. This is 28th of September 2005. Police are warning as a black panther near his cheetle. Also, it says in here, won't be down. It's a black panther which are protected by international law. There have been suggestions that gun owners have been getting together to try and track down the animal. Certainly to prosecute anybody who tried to do anything with it. 
I can remember that side, and that's back in 2005. And so there you are. That was the police encouraging people not to shoot. Yes, yeah. And I've got a friend, uh, he's a policeman, called here camping, and he said he lands in station up at Stoke. They'd seen one, but nobody believed him. They all asked him what he'd been drinking like, you know. <laughs> Mind you, we've had several police officers and ex-police officers on this podcast. Yeah. Through the series of podcasts, so... We're building up our contacts with police officers and retired police officers and they're extremely useful people to have amongst the network. And very observant people, of course. Yeah. I'd forgotten this other story. This is an interesting one. This is when there was a shoot around here back in the 1990s, one of the chaps in the shoot. He was a lad about five or six back in, I think it was about 1954. And where... He lived up in the potteries. It was a scrapyard. And they had two Black Panthers, pets, in the scrapyard. And they had three kittens. And him and a couple of his mates after school at night, about six weeks, used to call in every night to have a look at the kittens. After a while, they got fed up, so they didn't bother going for about six months. And uh, the next time they went to look at the kittens, it was just the two adults. Uh, and then they found out later that they'd been let go up back a leak on the roaches. And that was about 1954, that was. So there were three let go then. So, you know, you can see where it all comes from. Listeners will know that on this podcast and beyond this podcast, in, in my information, we've now had several across Britain in different places of, of scrapyard situations hosting them. Do you know if those ones were used as guarding animals? He never said that. He just he just said that, you know, he just was being kids like they used to love going looking at him. That was in the fifties then, Nick, that one? About nineteen fifty four or fifty five, I think. Yeah. Just shows you how long ago some of these releases were. Yeah, yeah. And the other interesting ones when my daughter was um at local school, her friend's father he used to have to go through Melbourne, which is in Leicestershire to work in the mornings and some mornings about half past seven when he went through the village he'd see a chap walking his black panther on a lead on the curb you know so just like a dog that's right yeah things like that is why the legislation came in in, in 1976 it was yeah. regarded as too risky for people to do that sort of thing he's like me with a wild boar you, you know you have to have a dangerous animal license but they were big softies really more than they because they were a bit like my dogs <laughs> Near me, we've got them in the Forest of Dean, you'll know that. They're yeah. adapting to life there. And, of course, they do have an ecosystem you know, benefit. I know they can mess places up like graveyards and cricket grounds, and it's horrible when that happens. But I think that's a fencing and management issue. They're out, and we've got to learn to coexist with them. And, of course, the, the big cats in the Forest of Dean will be snaffling some of the wild boar piglets. Oh, definitely, yeah. The tail end Charlies. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that one of the strategies for them getting the uh, piglets, this happens in, in India, a leopard will go up to a sleeping sow with the piglets, you know, under her and yeah. wake her up, you know, do something which wakes her up and she sort of jumps with fright and, and worry and alarm. In that moment, the leopard will just snatch one of the piglets and go away, you know, run off. So with minimal yeah. effort, it's got a nice, good meal just by that strategy. And it'd fly up a tree with that as well. It would, because there's no weight to them. Yeah. My pigs, uh, when they farrowed, because it was in the woodland area we got, they'd lie flat in the leaf litter from the autumn leaves, and you wouldn't see them. They were lying flat. But w within 24 hours, them piglets, they could run at 25 mile an hour. Wow. It was amazing, really. The big ones, for their weight and size, can hurtle along fast too, can't they? Oh, yes. Yeah, me big boar eyes and uh, they, could, uh, they can shift. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've twice in the Forest of Dean been close to a, a single male, presumably a satellite male boar, and they've known that I've been around, but they've waited till I've gone, till they've flushed away. They could have bulldozed me over, but they've just waited to avoid a commotion. Yeah, what they'll do, you see, because they've got very poor eyesight, very good sense of smell, very good hearing. So. 
sometimes people say, oh, that pig comes started running towards me. What he's doing, he's coming to try and see what it is he can smell or hear. And then he'll blow, he'll blow a whistle through his, now and again they do, just a, a whistle through the nostrils. And then they'll just turn and take off. In a way, badgers do act like that as well, because badgers have got very poor eyesight. Yeah. And I've had badgers in the night time hurtling towards me and then veer off just to, and you think you're being attacked. And of course, all it is is the badger working out what's going on and who's... What it is. Yeah. I always remember my big ball when, when I first had them. He came out the edge of the wood. Of course, we've got some paddock areas. They've got like eight acres all together split off in different compartments. Well, I'll make sure they had a little bit of paddock each end of the wood. He came out of the clearing of the wood. He couldn't see me because he was a bit too far off. He come trotting up the field and then did a couple of three grunts. And then his hair went up on his back and he blew this great big whistle out through his nostrils. It's like someone out at the prehistoric times and then literally took off back in the woods. But then after a few weeks, they would just become like the dogs, calm down to it. They'd become domesticated virtually, you know, but very, very intelligent animals, believe you me. Yeah, I had good cow dogs, but the boars were as equally as clever as the dogs. Very clever. Very nice that we got boar into the bargain in our conversation because I, I wasn't aware you had experience with that. That's very interesting. Yeah, we formed them between 1998 and uh, 2012. Say they were wild in your woodland, what would you think would happen? What sort of differences would it make to the woodland if you had foraging wild pigs or wild boar? I never let it overstock. Just a low enterprise going along with what we did farming. When they were saying to farmers, you know, tell farmers to try something different. And we did, but it didn't pay a penny, but it was nice to see him. But they're very shallow rooters, very shallow rooters. So they made no mess like a domestic thing unless you put a ring in its nose, it'll dig down three foot, you know. We got deer fencing, I got deer fencing, and that was trenched into 18 inches. And then we got 1.5 mil main electric wire, eight inches up, eight inches away from the fence. They'd always be testing that, see if it was on or off. You'd hear these little squeaks when you touched it with a nose and give them a belt. It's a boggy area we've got, and we've got quite a bit of archaeology going on the farm, Stone Age, Middle Stone Age stuff. They actually, when they're being shallow rooted, they take all the brambles off this, probably half an acre of bog area, and we discovered we've got a burial mound in there, some alignments, clay pier structure, which was man made, probably Bronze Age. So, you know, they, they were very, very sort of part of the environment, you could say. Yes. The down of where them probably was on the environmental sign, I think the grass snakes suffered quite a bit because anything went through them bends along the stretch area, they could take them out straight away, you know. Yes. Well, it's nice you've got grass snakes. Yes, yeah. Even they've suffered, I think, since the buzzards have become more prominent. Of course, they'll take them, you know. They don't see the grass snakes like they used to. My colleague here who takes Big Cat reports in Gloucestershire, a guy called Frank Tunbridge, I remember he once had a guy report a puba, a mountain lion, playing with a grass snake, flicking it up and tossing it about, just like a cat does with a mouse. What a sighting, you know, and you, you can quite understand a cat, a big cat, doing that with a grass snake. Big cats can handle reptiles and snakes, I think, a non-venomous one like a grass snake. Yeah. Fair game to a cat, I think. Oh, that's interesting. All grist to the mill and... Oh, well, final point. Do you have metal detectors on your land? If not, I've got some who might be interested, if if you don't. Yes, we... I mean, if somebody wants to come an hour, come an hour. Where I'm sitting here in the log shed, we've got a display cabinet with the finds from metal detectors over the years and the Stone Age stuff and digs I did back in the 90s on certain structures. We go back to the Neolithic. Well, there's a bit of Mesolithic in there as well. Not far from where we own the uh, leg of lamb up in the Scotch pine tree. It's a north-facing slope and we've got a little outcropper up there. There's 18 cups indentations that is rubbed into the rock face, wrist trail a distance apart and rock markings just been put in with a probably roe deer antler on that piece of rock as well. That's probably celestial. It does meet the midsummer sun as it's setting in its most northerly point. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, because we've got a metal detectorists here that double up as big cat 
people because they've seen big cats when they've done it. And I'm sure they'd love to come and camp and do some metal detecting. Yeah, you're more than welcome, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. The only time they wouldn't be able to metal detect is when the A measures up. Once it's been cut, then they'll go, you know, because the grass is gone. Yeah, what's that, mid-July? Yeah, we. I think it's, what is it, uh, say, if you say sort of 26 in July, you know, it's gone by there. I'm saying that the wet summer we've had this this last year, right, it was September when we got some of it, because we can't cut before July. We've been on mid-year payments. You can't beat June, eh, but then you wouldn't get your payments on that. So, you know, that's what it is. Good stuff. Doesn't it show you how all these topics connect up? We're talking about big cats, yeah. We're talking about wild boar and metal detecting, archaeology. Yeah. Grass snakes, <laughs> door mice. <laughs> it's, it just shows you big yeah. cats are part of the ecosystem, doesn't it? Yes. One of the things I'm hoping it'll come off, I don't know whether it will, is looking at pine marting reintroduction eventually, and I'm, I'm hoping that comes sooner or later so somebody can nail these grey squirrels. Very good, yeah, let nature do the culling. Nature's own biological control. Yeah, so I'm hoping at some point something will come of that. It's starting to roll out, isn't it, pine martin uh, reinforcements and pine martin reintroductions. I think it's just yeah. a question of time and a bit of learning from places where it's happened already, like this happened in the Forest of Dean in the last few years. And, you know, any lessons from that and they'll pass it on and hopefully roll it out a bit yeah. more. If they want the red squirrel back eventually, that's the only way of getting them back is getting rid of the greys. And the only sensible way of getting rid of the greys is the pine martin. But then people do argue that point that yes they take birds and bird eggs but then if you work out one pine martin what that will eat compared to 100 grey squirrels which do take bird eggs and young birds is the balance of nature yeah they're right little predators but they still have an ecosystem benefit overall exactly exactly yeah Great. I think we better close it there. I'm sure listeners have really enjoyed hearing from you, Nick. So good to hear all your experience, and we'll keep in touch. Yes, and as, as I say, any sightings that come up, I shall let you know straight away. Brilliant. I'll also uh, email you Gail's telephone number if you want to have a word with her on her sighting up here. She's actually going to the loop, the portal loop, from the caravan when she saw the cat sitting in the middle of the track in front of her. We'll do that for a future episode because sometimes it'd be nice to link the two on the same episode, but I think we've got more than enough for this one. And so we'll, we'll hear from yes. Gail on another episode in the future. And if we have the talk up here, she'll obviously be here for that, you know. Brilliant. Okay then, Rick. Been nice talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on Big Cat Conversations. Thank you.